section 16.8, Stokes' theorem. The figure shows an oriented surface with unit normal vector n. The orientation of s induces the positive orientation of the boundary curve c shown in the figure. This means that if you walk in the positive direction around c with your head pointing in the direction of n, then the surface will always be in your left. Take a look at that little guy walking around, surface n, well, surface s, the unit vectors n, the surface is always on their left. So it's very similar to Green's theorem when we had our positively oriented curve and the uh, domain inside was always on the left. So if S is an oriented piecewise smooth surface that is bounded by a simple closed piecewise smooth boundary curve C with positive orientation, then we'll let F be a vector field whose components have continuous partial derivatives on an open region in R3 that contains S and then R line integral f dot dr will be equal to the surface integral of the curl of f dot ds. So this is actually kind of cool because when our surface is flat, notice we'll have this equal to the surface integral of the curl of f dot k da because if our surface is flat, then our normal vector just points straight up all the way throughout, where i and j are zero and it's k, and so f dot n ds just becomes uh, f dot k da. So curl of f dot k da. So that's actually kind of cool because this means that we have this vector form of Green's theorem. So when the surface is flat, Stokes' theorem becomes Green's theorem. So we get Green's theorem for free if we prove Stokes' theorem. Unfortunately, we are not going to prove Stokes' theorem because it's even harder to prove than Green's theorem. So how about instead we use Stokes' theorem to evaluate a line integral. So we'll take our line integral f dot dr and we'll take advantage of the fact that we can express it as a surface integral. So we've got f of x, y, z equal to minus y squared i plus x, j plus z squared k. c is the curve intersection of the plane, y plus z equals 2, and the cylinder, x squared plus y squared equals 1. So what we'll do is we'll draw our curve of intersection. So we're taking some cylinder and we're slicing it at this angle because we're slicing it for the uh, plane y plus z equals 2. So it should look something like this. So this will be, let's say, y plus z equal 2. We need to put some axes. So how about we make this our z-axis. And it can go down over here. And then this can be our y-axis. And we'll make this our x-axis. So that means that, uh, let's say this is our disk D in the plane, and we have our curve that's uh, oriented to be counterclockwise when viewed from above. So that's like this. This is our curve C, counterclockwise. And we want to take advantage of Stokes' theorem. So what we'll do is, instead of computing the line integral over C, we'll compute the surface integral over s. So we'll take this uh, kind of region over here, this flat slice, because notice Stokes' theorem says it's the curl of f dot ds over s, where s is any uh, surface oriented piecewise smooth surface that is bounded by c. So that means that we could make s any kind of weird surface we wanted to, as long as the boundary in the end is C. So we might as well make it as simple as possible. We could just make it the interior of this little slice over here, so it'll be nice and flat. And then the surface integral should be fairly easy. We can just make uh, Z a function of X and Y and express it as a double integral, as opposed to having to do our line integral from scratch. So what we'll do is we'll call S this surface We'll compute the curl of f. So 
the curl of f is equal to uh, the determinant of this matrix with i, j, and k, and partial with respect to x, partial with respect to y, and partial with respect to z for del, and then it's crossed with f, so f is minus y squared, x and z squared, and we take our determinant and we should get 1 plus 2yk. Notice that both the uh, i's and j's end up being 0 when we take our partials because taking the partial with respect to y of z, z with respect to x, it just ends up being 0 for i and j. So now we'll do our line integral as a surface integral. So f dot dr will be computed as the surface integral over s of the curl of f dot ds, which is the double integral over d of minus p times the partial of g with respect to x minus q times the partial of g with respect to y plus r da where we set uh, z as a function of x and y. So notice we can solve for z if we just make z equal to minus y. So by doing that, we get the integral from 0 to 2 pi, because what we'll do is we'll use polar coordinates because we've got a boundary disk, and then we've got the radius going from 0 to 1. So we have, let's see, minus the partial of p times partial of g with respect to x. Notice there's no x, so there's 0. Uh, notice that if we take the partial with respect to y, that's just going to be minus 1. But that doesn't even matter because, remember, we're taking p, q, and r from our vector field, in this case, as the curl of f. So the curl of f didn't have any p or q. They were both 0 because our i's and j's were both 0. So we really only have to worry about r. And r is just um, 1 plus 2y times k, so 1 plus 2y. So that'll be 1 plus 2 r sine theta. And then we'll have r dr d theta. So we'll just make this the integral from 0 to 2 pi, take our antiderivative, we'll get r squared over 2 plus 2 times r cubed over 3 times the sine of theta from 0 to 1. And that becomes the integral from 0 to 2 pi of half 1 plus 2 thirds sine theta d theta, which is half of 2 pi plus 0, which is pi. So Stokes' theorem can be used to make line integrals a lot easier to evaluate if we have a convenient surface that we can take the curl of and then uh, evaluate the surface integral of. But we could also use Stokes' theorem to compute line integrals more easily because sometimes it's more convenient to compute a line integral than a surface integral. So we could use it to compute a messy surface integral, a messy curl of f surface integral easily. So for an example of that, let's use Stokes' theorem to compute the surface integral curl of f dot ds, where f is given by this for a vector field, and f is the part of the sphere that lies inside the cylinder. So it's a part of this sphere, x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 4, that happens to lie inside this cylinder over here. So it's this highlighted part. So what we'll do is, instead of computing the surface integral over the surface directly, because it looks a little bit messy, we will compute the line integral over this boundary curve, which is just a circle. So line integral over a circle should be super nice. So what we'll do is we'll say, well, we need to parametrize this thing. So how about we say x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 4, and x squared plus y squared equals 1 implies that, let's see, if we subtract, then these guys cancel, 
we just get z squared equals 4 minus 1, which is 3. So z squared equals 3. Notice z is positive over here. So we have z equal to square root of 3, no minus. So that means that we have x squared plus y squared equals 1 for our circle, this boundary circle. And we have z equal to square root of 3. So now we've parametrized it. We have r of t equal to cosine t i plus sine t for j, because that's our circle. And then it just goes up rad 3 for z for k, where t goes between 0 and 2 pi. So we'll take our derivative to compute our line integral. And we get minus sine t i plus cosine tj. So that means that f of r of t will be equal to square root of 3 times cosine ti plus square root of 3 times sine tj plus cosine t sine tk because f is equal to xc for i so we just plug in x and z and then it's yz for j we plug in y and z we plug in xy for k we just parametrize our vector field so now we have our surface integral of the curl of f dot ds equal to the line integral by stokes theorem of f dot dr which is equal to the integral from 0 to 2 pi of our dot product f of r of t and r prime of t, which is just the integral from 0 to 2 pi of minus the square root of 3 cosine t sine t plus the square root of 3 sine t cosine t dt. So notice we have, we can pull out the rad 3, but then left inside we will just have minus cosine t sine t plus sine t cosine t. So that's just 0. So the whole thing is just 0.